Good evening. Uh, my name is David Ornstein, and um, I actually had the privilege of working with David Rubinoff and his violin for 15 years as his personal pianist and his arranger. And I'm going to share in a relatively short lecture, as far as lectures go, my story, um, my Rubinoff story with you. He was a most amazing man. Like I say, he was wonderful and yet wild at the same time. It was, it was a, a privilege to work with a man like this. His name was David Rubinoff. His, that was his stage name and his violin. The and his violin part was given to him in 1929. That was the year he bought his Stradivarius violin at the Wurlitzer Auction in New York. The David Rubinoff part of his title was the name given to him at birth, and he was born in 1897. We began working together in 1970. My apprenticeship and our friendship lasted the rest of David's life. That was another 15 years. How we met was totally by happenstance, unless you believe that things are meant to be. At the time, I was a liberal arts music major at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. On a particular day, I was walking by the music office. A professor, Dr. Maurice Hochberg, had just received a phone call. As he held the phone in one hand, he summoned me with the other to talk to David. Dave, said Dr. Hochberg, I have a violinist named Rubinoff. He needs an accompanist who is also an arranger. It's only because I was passing by the music office at that particular moment <coughs> that I am now standing here in front of this kind and gracious audience. And less than one year ago, Maestro Joseph Rubin had seen some of the Rubinoff blogs on our website, which is called DSO Works. It sounds like Detroit Symphony Orchestra, but it's David and Sharon Orenstein. Works.com. He informed me that I was the last and oldest person to have worked with Rubinoff and his violin. He said that he's been trying to arrange for a special concert to commemorate him. Aren't we all lucky, I'll tell you. Today becomes the fruition of four years of work on this dream. The frosting on the cake for me will be violinist Stephen Greenman, and I will be playing selections for my arrangements of the Rubinoff score and my score to the Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and he always got a standing ovation for that. No matter if you put it in the beginning of the program, later in the program, everyone loves the Fiddler on the Roof, especially on the violin. Back to the Rubinoff story. In June of 1970, I set up an audition with Rubinoff. He was residing in a posh penthouse at the Leland House in downtown Detroit, even before I rang his doorbell. I knew I was about to meet a master of show business. While many are only concerned with first impressions, Rubinoff made a powerful first pre-impression. He had a hand-carved wooden door with a violin surrounded by musical notes on a staff and flowers. When he rang his doorbell, it played the musical theme song from his hit 1930s radio show. During that time, he became an American icon. Typically, after Sunday church services, Americans went straight home. Their objective was to listen to Rubinoff and his violin on the Eddie Cantor show, radio show. Uh, Dave conducted and played with a full NBC orchestra. His theme song, Give Me a Moment, Please, was chimed by his doorbell. His apartment suite was breathtaking. Dave paid homage to America with his decor. He was born in the Ukraine in 1897. What did the average Ukrainian think of America at that time? The Wild West personified America. Yes, cowboys and Indians. David was particularly taken with the Indians. Not, he left everything about them. 
in his suite were countless Indian artifacts and paintings. Many were just given to him by Frank Phillips of Phillips Petroleum. He had his own museum in New York. And he actually let Rubinoff go in one day and pick any three paintings out of his museum that he wanted. That's how much everybody loved the rich, poor, everybody loved Rubinoff. His number one prized possession, however, and it was the first thing he pointed out to me when I went into his penthouse, was a portrait of himself painted as an Indian chief with a headdress, feathers, and all. His spacious office was plastered with photographs from the floor molding to the ceiling. Subjects included himself with numerous American presidents and famous actors, musicians, and comedians. He even had a photo of his name up in flashing lights on a Broadway marquee. He played Broadway. At that point, I said to Dave, and this is, this is the, really the key to the whole lecture right here, music has been good to you. And he looked right at me, directly at me, and replied with his heavy Russian accent, that's because I've been good to music. <laughs> you know, very, uh, it's true with any profession. If you're good to your profession, it will be good to you. Our first encounter, uh, uh, I played the Ballade Number no. 1 by Chopin. I was working on my, just starting to work on my master's degree in music, which I did get from Wayne State University. Dave not only complimented me, but also the great piano arranging techniques used by Chopin. Then he explained his, uh, he explained his arranging techniques. It was quite scientific. He had an immense filing system that included thousands of accompaniments from any piano piece that he thought could serve as a background for his violin solo. However, since we were started working together, he often preferred many of my own suggestions because I was also inventive. Hopefully, I still am. I worked with him six days weekly during the first summer. Uh, once, college, once college started, we worked on weekends and full-time during the winter and spring breaks. He had the reputation for being both tough and temperamental. However, we had the right working chemistry. I sensed a grandfather-grandson relationship develop that I never experienced before. That's because both sets of my grandparents had been killed in the Holocaust. Dave, at the time we met, was single. He married a number of times before. Also, he had not yet uh, met his last wife, Darlene Azar. However, this, his true and constant love was music. Every beautiful melody, and I'm not exaggerating here, was his mistress. Even when we had lunch at the deli on our first work day, that was apparent. Our project was the skater's waltz from the movie Love Story. He hummed the tune all the way down the elevator. At the bottom, he'd exclaim, that's the most beautiful melody I ever heard. The next day, as we walked to the deli, he'd hum the fascination waltz. For sure, that day's melody was the most beautiful ever. We didn't always go to the deli. He also delighted in cooking the world's greatest hamburger. He called it hamburger a la Rubinoff. He had an ego, but he, he's entitled. <laughs> I have a favorite story from our deli days. Um, uh, it, I have to confess to everybody here, I didn't appreciate that I was working with a genius until, re until I started working on this project because I started thinking about everything I'm writing and I'm saying, oh my gosh, I worked with this man, you know? And it's, it's uh, anyways, he loved corned beef and pastrami. On my winter break, it was a blustery, snowy day. Dave was wearing a godfather coat and a hat. The coat was completely unbuttoned. He was oblivious to the cold as he hummed a line from the fiddler on the roof. He was also carrying the Romanov Stradivarius violin in a beat-up old violin case. I suddenly saw a gang of about 12 young men walking directly towards us. When they were about a block away, they must have noticed the violin case and thought it held a machine gun. <laughs> the entire gang jaywalked across the street to avoid us. I think it was because Rubinoff looked like an older hit man that never got hit. 
Oh yes, there's another violin case story. Somehow Dave got possession of a genuine alligator skin. It had all the original fins and markings. It's still, um, he wanted it made into a violin case. The problem was hunting alligators in the United States was illegal. So was making any product from an alligator skin. Dave solved the problem. He sent the skin to Germany. The violin case came back as a crafted masterpiece. Here's a story about the impression his new case made. Until this last year, and by the way, he did give a concert at Circle, I think it was in 1977, and that's where he met his, the Darlene Azar, who he later married. So this is, this is, this, there's something special about this place. David played, for, until his last year, David played for school assemblies in the public schools. One year, we were working on my, in my Sarasota home. Uh, he made contact with the string chamber group in Venice, Florida. I'll never forget our entrance for the concert. Everyone was so taken with this case that they could have cared less that it held a Stradivarius violin. <laughs> for them, the alligator case said it all. How was it that Rubinoff came to America? The year was 1911. Victor Herbert was the conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony. He went on a sabbatical. One of his stops was the Warsaw Royal Conservatory, then under the direction of Paderewski. There, 13-year-old David was performing his graduation recital. As it happened, Victor Herbert was in the audience. Rubinoff was playing his own composition, which you're going to hear tonight, played by Stephen Greenman. And you can, you'll un appreciate what I'm about to tell you when you hear Stephen play the Dance of the Russian Peasant. It's something that's a once in a lifetime experience. Dave deliberately made it as difficult as possible so his professor would not be able to play it. But there was a reason for this. At the time, he was studying violin under a professor Drasner for his graduation. Rubinoff stated in his autobiography entitled Dance of the Russian Peasant, by the way, his uh, last wife, Darlene Azar, wrote the book. Um, the, he hit my fingers with his bow. I started to play the passage again and again, and he kept hitting my fingers. Once he hit my fingers when I didn't even play it. When I objected, he replied, never mind, it would have been wrong anyways. He had a real attitude. David's Dance of the Russian Peasants certainly impressed Victor Herbert, who was in the audience. As a result, he felt strongly enough about this upcoming violinist composer to sponsor David and his entire family. He paid to bring them all to America. For the first years, David apprenticed and worked with Victor Herbert. Through this famed conductor, he was fortunate enough to meet who's who in America. And that really got him on, started on the road to fame and riches. Every Sunday evening, Herbert had VIP parties at his home. Guests included such distinguished performers as the great Caruso, Madame schumann Heink, and of course, John Philip Sousa. Dave Rubinoff and I gave many concerts together. When he was 86 years of age, a most remarkable one was in the Catskill Mountains at Scott Sequaga Lake House in New York. This 45 minute concert is viewable on YouTube. My daughter, who is in the audience today, uh, uh, put the entire 45 minute concert and just, it's called, we'll look up David Rubinoff, Lost Concert Found, and you will not believe what this man was able to do even at 86. You can see how Dave liked and talked to the audience. In theater jargon, this is called Breaking the Fourth Wall. On this YouTube concert, like I said, entitled Lost Concert Found, he said, now at age 86, I can hardly play the dance of the Russian peasant myself. Be the young kid has made a little smart out of guess. I'm gonna write something that nobody can play. <laughs> That's the biggest mistake I have. Now, the age of, I'll be 86 September the 3rd. I can hardly play myself. <laughs> you can appreciate why Victor Herbert told him, Son, you belong to America. 
America benefited in many ways from his artistry. Rubinoff and his violin became a household word in the 1930s. As a matter of fact, at the depths of the Great Depression, he made as much in actual dollars, 1930 dollars, as 500,000 a year playing the violin and conducting. He brought joy and pleasure to the millions that had to eat in soup kitchens just to survive. David's life is an inspiring rags to riches story. Here are a few of life's highlights presented by the Associated Press, October 7th, 1986. Mr. Rubinoff was born September the 3rd, 1897 at Grodno, Russia. He had four brothers and sisters. His father was a tobacco factory worker. His mother was a laundress. At age five, he persuaded his parents to buy him a violin. He attended the Forbes School of Music in Pittsburgh and became the uh, leader of the stringed orchestra. He worked part-time in a cafe and also played the violin. He also sold newspapers on the streets. Mr. Rubinoff eventually became a soloist with the Pittsburgh Symphony and began to conduct. He went on to become guest conductor with orchestras in the United States and abroad. He eventually became a regular conductor and soloist at the Paramount Theater in New York and for Paramount Pictures in Hollywood. If you look up Dave Rubinoff on your um, website, it's all free too. You don't even, you just, you will not believe what the, how this man could play. He had such precision, and when he wanted to slow something up, he did it so perfectly. He'd always say, this should slow up just like a drunken sailor falling over on a ship. I mean, that's how it should slow up. I mean, and he, uh, he, he, the only thing he ever bragged about to me was his rhythm was, uh, uh, when we were working. Um, Rudy Valley saw him and signed him under contract for the Eddie Cantor show. Uh, by the way, I'm mentioning all these names. You can see them all at, at uh, Maestro Rubin's Big Band Museum uh, right here in Circleville. Um, uh, and it's during his career, he played at the White House for President Hoover, five times for Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Nixon, and Kennedy. He credits Will Rogers with his success through the popular concert. Will was a stage and motion picture actor, humorist, and social commentator from Oklahoma. Will's ancestry is from the Cherokee Indian Nation. At this point, I must also introduce David's last wife, Darlene Azar. She wrote her husband's autobiography from his recorded voice. Dave stated about Will Rogers. Will Rogers used to give me advice. He was a happy fellow and a pleasure to be near. Will advised me on timing, how to time my gestures, how to get the audience to do my bidding, and how to talk to provoke the appropriate responses. Will gave Rubinoff a giant pocket watch for a present. He encased a picture of him and David. It had the following inscription engraved, to the greatest fiddler in the world, your pal, Will Rogers, 1932. Will had a poem engraved on the back of the watch. Rubinoff recited it at every concert he gave. His concerts were inspirational. He not only played the violin, he inspired people to really do something with their lives. And I'm going to quote this poem that he read to every audience. He'd be very happy up there. The clock of life is wound but once. And no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time we own. So live, love, and toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. And so playing, also, Rubinoff played for children, and that lengthened David's career. After the golden age of radio, um, also, children uh, have more years in front of them to relish wonderful memories. If you read the, Ru the blogs about Rubinoff, or not the blogs, but the comments, it's all from people who are now quite elderly who said they'll never forget him. He made a doubly strong impression because he made it a point to take his music to small towns and villages in America. 
um, so how did a foreign-born violinist come to play for school assemblies in rural America? It's very appropriate he played here in 1977, and he's being commemorated here too. His connection was through John Philip Sousa. The American March King arranged for a U.S. State Department grant for this purpose. For the final part of my Rubinoff story, I'll relate some stories of my own performing experience. He was, in retrospect, he was a character with a capital C. I mean, everything we did was both wonderful and at the same time wild. Our experience in the early 1980s at the Governor's Club in Florida, however, took the cake. Dave always was quite outspoken. He either liked or disliked something. You'd know about it. Fortunately, once he started to play his violin, all was forgiven. We walked into the Governor's Club to enjoy a lavish sit-down dinner. We were scheduled to play a 45-minute concert afterwards. The house was packed with legislators, judges, and other VIPs. The play settings were adorned with four or five glasses for wine, expensive silverware, and beautiful china. Dining had already begun. Soft classical music was coming in through the speakers, and conversations were genteel and present. Suddenly, Rubinoff screams. I'm not going to use the exact word he um, used, but I'm going to uh, say something close to it. This place is too darn fancy for me. However, the polite audience did its best to overlook this unusual outburst. Luckily, we weren't thrown out. As a result, uh, our first selection by Chartist by Monte had a lukewarm reception. By our second selection, the music began to work to its wizardry. Soon, the distinguished legislators were in his pocket. Eventually, our performance drew numerous bravos, three standing ovations, we played two encores. Afterwards, I, have proud and not, I felt proud and honored to have entertained at this prestigious venue. Best of all, I had a true a la Rubinoff experience. My next story, I have two more stories, or three, is called The Scrow Brothers Have a Rubinoff Experience. The Scrow Brothers also played at your Southern Hotel here in Columbus. The Scrow Brothers, Dom and Tony, are virtuoso harmonica players. They were booked at the Southern Hotel in Columbus, Ohio. Rubinoff performed there the day before they entertained, and they were in the audience. The Scrows got more than what they bargained for. While Rubinoff was playing his violin, he heard someone talking. It happened to be a backstage hand. Because of the acoustics, Dave thought it was somebody in the audience. Rubinoff lost his temper. He stopped playing in the middle of the fascination waltz, and began a five-minute-long tirade directed at the audience. It included a number of rough words. The gist was, you pay all this good money to see me and have the nerve to talk while I am playing. The Scrow Brothers, seasoned stage veterans, had never seen anything like this. They thought that at any moment, the audience would start pelting him with rotten tomatoes. That was their exact words. I'll never forget that. They were wrong. As soon as he finished his outburst, the entire audience stood up and gave him a five minutes ovation. After that, the Scrows dubbed him the master. Anywhere Rubinoff performed, they did their best to see him in action. Both the Scrows with me are part of my next uh, Rubinoff story. In the summer of 1983, I was employed in the Catskill Mountains as the house piano player for Scott's Oquaga Lake House. Scotty, the owner, had been trying for years to get the Scrow Brothers to entertain at his resort. After all, he thought they lived in Elmira, New York, which was only 90 miles away. <coughs> um, they always turned him down. They were too big and his pay was too small. The Scrows mostly played conventions, concert halls, and state fairs. However, because of my association with the Rubinoffs, Dave and his wife Darlene at the time, they changed their minds. Dave Rubinoff agreed to play at Scott's. There was nothing he wouldn't do for me. He was even willing to do it for free. The Rubinoffs arrived. Darlene was talking with Scotty's wife, Doris. She mentioned how, Doris mentioned how they had been trying for years to get the Scrows to play at their resort. Darlene went straight to the phone and called Dom and Tony Scrow. It was two hours before showtime. They raced to Scott's, 
uh, to hear the master. That finally broke the ice between Scotty and the Scrows. The two brothers came back for many years to entertain at Scott's and thrill his audiences. Of course, as the house piano player, I also became part of the rack. By the way, uh, the uh, Scott's Oquaga Lake House is in Deposit, New York, and they're filming a major film series, um, and they're the people that are filming it are um, spending a fortune to recondition the whole resort and put it in top shape for their television production. So just when it looked like the last, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the last uh, <laughs> re resort, I, I could call Scott's the last Castle Resort was, was about to go down, it's being pushed back up. Wherever, and I'm coming to my last Rubinoff story, Wherever and whenever Rubinoff played, nothing was ever the same. No violinist could compete with him. And if you watch his YouTube videos, you will agree with me. The story about the concertmaster of the Syracuse Symphony is rather poignant. The Scots were loyal and kind to their entertainers. Once they accepted you into their circle, it was a lifelong relationship. That's how things used to be in the Catskills. Year after year, you were asked back, Carl Silfer had been in the circle since 1939. They then came Rubinoff. He gave two concerts back to back during the summer of 1983. When Carl would return to play his violin, everyone would say to him, oh, you must be Rubinoff. We are all looking forward to hearing you. Carl was furious. From then on, I was only tolerated by Carl and certainly not liked. I learned an important lesson at Scott's through my adopted grandfather. Um, greatness is memorable, memorable, but a superstar is unforgettable. And Rubinoff certainly was a superstar. To conclude my lecture today, I'd like to repeat the words spoken at every concert by Rubinoff. Hopefully this world, these words will live on for many years Every time Will Rogers saw Rubinoff, he said, Ruby, remember the clock of life. Now is the only time we own, live, love, and toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. Thank you.